Okay. So um, we have our sort of stock definition of a lens so far. I'm just I'm just going to white out the uh, I just got it out the, the things that don't really matter for discussion. So given a lens and a function that knows how to take a b to a b, you know, a lens that knows how to get a b out of an a, and a function that just takes a b and gives you back a new b, we could we could get the value or get a b out of our a. We can apply our function to it, and then we can set it right back. All right, and here I'm gonna, I have to give back the result, or you could never see that it happened. There's no cure. Um, but also, I can compose lenses. So this was just using the getter and the setter together. Here what we're going to do is we're going to build a new lens given two lenses. So if I have a lens that knows how to get from A down to a B, and a lens that knows how to get from B down to a C, I can go all the way down from A to C. And this is where I was talking about how lenses are, are composable, purely functional references. Okay. Um, when, we, when we used the, the field accessors, I was just able to say underscore two dot underscore two equals something. Here I want to be able to, I want to compose these things together so that I can access, you know, the, the second field, the, the, the second argument of the second argument of my, you know, my third argument in a tuple or something like that. <laughs> so I can get down into, into deeper structures. So here what we're going to do is we're just going to use our self to get a B out of our A. Now we're going to get a C out of our B. Right? So we can, get, we can go from A to C. That's our getter. And given a C and an A, what I'm going to do is I want to modify my B field in my A. So I'm going to modify in, in my A by setting the B field that I just, um, that I just accessed. So this is going to yield a new B in which the C has been changed. So I had to use get and set and mod to build um, to build set, but I was able to pull it all together. So we were able to compose two lenses that kind of met head to tail. And um, we can define compose just like uh, function one has in in Scala, where we can say, you know, this is just the arguments, this is just and then with the arguments, or the argument and the, the thing that's being called unreversed. Um, just because it's fairly convenient. All right. So with those, um, I'm going to talk through just some example lenses. And we'll start with the ridiculously easy lens that takes, given any value A, I can get a unit out of it. <laughs> by ignoring. I can also take a unit and an A and give you an A by ignoring the unit. Okay, that was pretty boring. Um, I can get an A out of an A, right? Just by returning it and ignoring the old one, which is important to meet the laws. The choice of which A I use here is actually picked for me by the laws. I can't, it's, the choice of self is Unambiguous. Okay. But now I can also define a lens that knows how to access a member of a pair. Um, so if we just say I want a lens that knows how to get from a pair of an A and a B down to an A, I can access by getting the first member, but set by changing the first member. So we'll just use copy, the thing that I was maligning earlier in the talk. We'll, 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 we'll use it as a, as a building block. We just won't use it directly when, we, when we're going to compose. We're going to compose with lenses instead of trying to compose copies. And then second is just going to access the B out of an A and B pair and copy using the same construction. So you can see obviously how this becomes a fairly mechanical construction to access um, arguments to a case class, for instance. You could just boilerplate this. This could be written as a, as a plugin for the compiler, for instance. All right, um, and now we're starting to recover some of the utility of the original, you know, foo dot underscore two dot underscore two equals value. It's not quite as pretty yet. We can just say second and then second, and then set that given a foo to four, and this would take 
a pair of one and a two and a three and set this value to four. So it'll give you a new pair of pairs, <laughs> a pair of an int and a pair, where the, the second value in the second pair had been replaced. All right, well, those are, those are nice and kind of kind of cheesy. They don't really add any value here. But one of the things we were able to talk about with references was like, I got a value out of a map and I wanted to mutate something in it. I, you know, if I've, got a, if I've got a mutable value and I store it in a map, that's actually pretty convenient because I don't have to change the map to change the value. Um, or if I'm, if I'm looking at a set, um, I can do some things. So let's do something a little different. Let's play with, I want a lens that looks in at a given member of a set. Okay, so here what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a set of values of some key type k, and I'm gonna I want a lens that's going to yield a Boolean value. And the Boolean value it's going to yield is whether or not the set contains that key. Okay, that, that I don't think is all that earth shaking. What I think is kind of interesting is what it means for the setter to work. Right? The setter is going to take a Boolean value and a set, and it has to give me a new set. So when I set the Boolean value to true, it's actually going to add the key. And when I set it to false, it's going to remove the key from the set. So it's not just is this thing present, it's also the ability to add or remove elements from a set. Okay, so I could build a set, one, two, three. I could ask if the set contains two, and get, using this lens, the result for, for my current set. <coughs> and it'll say yes. I could also ask if it contains four, and add it. Or I could take, I could check to see if the set contains three, and set it to false. And this will actually remove an element from my set. All right? Um, and these compose, right? So if I wanted to, if I have a set of pairs or what have you, I can drill in on anything that I want. Um, I think some, somewhat more interesting to me is what it means to access the member of a, a member of a map. I can't get a value out of a map given a key, but I can get an option value. And the reason is, is because otherwise I'm going to violate those lens laws that I was talking about earlier on. Because what happens if I go to get a value for, a, uh, for something that's not present in my map? I would throw an exception. I would, be, I would, I would cease to be <laughs> purely functional. Um, so, and I, so, and I need enough information to know that I could set it to a new value or to represent the fact that it wasn't present at all. So when I go to use get, get's going to give me back an option of whether or not the value is present or not, and if it is what the value is. But when I go to write it back in, I'm going to write, and if I have some value, I have a key, I have a value, and I have a map. So I'm just going to add my key and my value to my, immut or to my immutable map, right? I just built a new map. And I wrote that back as the result of applying my center. So I gave you a new immutable map. On the other hand, if I, if I went to write none in as the value for this lens, I'm actually going to remove the element from the map. Okay, so we've conserved the amount of information present. We can read, we can get an option given a key, and we can write it back into our map, and we don't change the, the meaning of our map. Right? If we go to delete a key that's not there, we don't lose anything. Um, and so now we can build a map, just like we did with the set. We can ask if a member is present by just getting it. This, in this case, will tell me the fact that the result for key two was B. Um, I can set it to none, in which case I delete it from the resulting map. I could even change the value of a key. I can use modify and all those things to directly mutate members of a map as well. So far so good? I, I, I apologize for running fast. I just want to make sure we don't run over time. All right. So now I'm going to go off on a bit of a digression and talk about the state monad. And don't mind the scary word. Um, so what the heck is the state monad? Um, you, you've heard the term mostly used by Hasslers, sometimes by some Scala Z folks running around here. Um, 
the general idea of a state monadic action is that instead of having a value, A, what I actually want is I want a computation that will take some starting state and give me an A and a new state. Okay? So this doesn't make any sense without a state to feed to it. But once I have a state, I have a computation that will take that state, give me an answer, and give me a new state. <coughs> okay? So far so good? So let's just think of a few things that we could do with this without thinking about any sort of composition. If I just had a, a value of type A lying around, um, I could make a state action that just took a state, ignored it, and gave me back my A. That's kind of a boring example, but it's a perfectly reasonable co uh, state computation. It doesn't do anything with my state, but it's, it's just lifting a pure value in, into my state mode. Um, on the other hand, if I had a new state and I didn't care about my old one, what I could do is I could build a state action that, you know, I, I don't actually care about its result value, it's just going to give me a unit. And it's going to ignore my state too. All it's going to do is change the state to my new, my new result. And then this name I don't really like. Um, in Scala Z it's init, in the Haskell universe it's get. It's get and put. Um, and what we do is we init, init goes through and takes the state and reads it out as the value A. So it's a state action that yields a value that has the same type as my state. Okay, so we haven't really done anything interesting. We just kind of played around with putting types where they fit. Um, so what can we do? Well, um, Scala gives us some wonderful sugar for playing around with maps and flat maps and stuff. So it would be a shame not to use it. Um, so we can map over state actions. If I have a state action that knows how to take an S and give me an A, and I have a function that knows how to take, that, take it uh, and, and a new state. And I know if I have a function that knows how to take an A and get a B, I could turn this into a state action that takes an S and gives me a B and a new state just by computing my A and my output state and applying my pure function. But it doesn't care about my state. It should be state SB, right? Did I get that wrong? Equals state SB, yes. Pay no attention to that letter. That's <laughs> what so I get for writing this off the cuff. Uh, all right, I get, I get it right in the next slide. <laughs> all right, so far so good. So we can just make a, a pure, we can transform from a state SA to a state SB by applying a function from A to B. 